Okay, it's a pleasant afternoon to you all. Uh, welcome to this uh, week's episode of the Zimbabwe Historical Association seminar series. Today, in today's discussion, we have uh, the very vibrant and uh, energetic uh, legal guru and uh, tobacco expert, uh, Dr. Sivani Inube, who's gonna be giving us uh, a talk uh, today on, on this uh, seminar series. Um, I believe uh, Dr. Sivani Inube needs no introduction uh, within the historical circles of uh, studies in history, uh, but all the same. Uh, Dr. Sivani Inube is a doctoral fellow at uh, the University of the Free State, uh, the International Studies Group, and is also a lecturer at the University of Zimbabwe, uh, what was formerly the Department of Economic History, which is now the Department of uh, Knowledge, History, Heritage, and Knowledge Systems. Uh, Dr. Sibaning Inube is going to be giving us uh, a talk uh, that is entitled uh, Not Noble Anymore. Uh, Kia Kia. Apologies, apologies. Uh, something just went wrong on my end. Uh, but without wasting any further time, uh, I'll give the floor to Dr. Nube, who's going to give us his uh, presentation. And then soon after, immediately after, uh, we will get into a plenary session. Uh, so Dr. Nube. And oh, yes, uh, for those who perhaps would want to save out on bandwidth and the network connection, uh, feel free to put off your cameras, but uh, you're also equally welcome uh, to put on your cameras. And you're also free to chat any questions that you have uh, within the chat box as the seminar proceeds. Thank you very much. Over to you, Dr. Nube. Thank you very much, Dr. Kamuma. Uh, I hope everybody is here with I... I'm using Stuart's laptop. I'm struggling to, to join with mine, but I hope everybody hears me. Uh, can we just go there's, a lot, there's a lot of feedback on your on your end. Can can you adjust something? I don't know what it is. Okay. Hello. It's still making this uh, funny hush horsey sound whenever you speak. I try to deal with this. Am I, am I clear now? Uh, no. Can you perhaps log off and re log on again? Uh, apologies for that. Uh, this, we will not blame uh, Dr. Mule, but uh, blame the different service providers for the network issue. Uh, can we just give him a few more seconds uh, and he relogs on to the platform? Hello? Any improvement? Perfect. It's now perfect. Right. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much, colleagues, and my apologies for for these hitches. You see, some of us we struggle with these things. But anyway, I intend to share with you my ideas and the on on, on a very new area of of study for me. Uh, colleagues would know that I normally write on tobacco. But uh, I then decided to venture, to try and venture into this area. And the topic, as uh, Brian has said, is not, not noble anymore. Uh, Kia Kia lawyering in Zimbabwe's criminal justice diva system since 2000. 
uh, <clears throat> these are very, these are my uh, ideas, which are very preliminary. Uh, maybe I may need to say that uh, this same uh, uh, topic has been accepted for Dr. Mjere and Dr. Kwaivanan's uh, New Dimensions in African Studies is the workshop that is due next month. So this is still work in progress uh, as I move towards coming up with a paper for that workshop in, on the 24th of the rest of Zimbabwe. So I really welcome suggestions on how I can fine tune the, the, my ideas to come up with, a, with an interesting paper. So uh, the title, not, not noble anymore, comes from this, uh, you see the normal talk that the legal profession is the noble profession. So what I'm trying to do there is to put it under academic scrutiny in the period 2000 to, to the present to see if it still stands as the noble profession. Uh, and in doing so, I engage two strands of literature. I engage the crisis literature of the so-called lost decade on the one hand, and I also engage legal, legal history on the other. So on the crisis, the period after 2000 is generally is a well-trodden period in terms of academic work on the crisis that the Zimbabwe is experienced. And I'm, I, I want to expand on that literature by giving the side of, of the, the legal side, how the crisis manifested itself in the legal profession. So I, I engage literature on the crisis to complement what we already have on the political crisis, the economic crisis, the social crisis. And in, in this particular case, I would want to look at how that crisis manifests itself in the criminal justice system, with particular focus on, the, on, le on private legal practice. Then on legal history, I intend to <coughs> Uh, oh, still on that, uh, still on the crisis literature, I wish to extend Jerem Johnson Kia Kia. I think you've already seen me putting it in there. I borrowed it from Jerem Jones, concept to legal practice under crisis. So I'm, I'm, I'm extending this, this, this concept to legal practice under crisis. Then to the emerging board of scholarship on Zimbabwe's legal history, whose major highlights, like I've said, is George Karkwevanan and Susan Behu. I hope I pronounce it well. I also wish to give the other side of the coin on that particular part. Because what we get from, from George and, and other writers in this area is, is, is the use or abuse of the law in the constitution and contestation of state power generally. Issues around court practices issues around uh, judicial capture, human rights, and that, those kind of issues. Those are the issues that come out of the work that, that we already have on legal history. And uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, I try to give the other side. The focus here you can see is that it's on the state and its agencies. So you will have Susan, Susan Behu, talking about riddles and good boys, patronage, intimidation, and resistance in Zimbabwe. So general's office after 2000. So basically, this year focuses on, on the prosecution as an agent of the state. Uh, you also have a, his, a new book. It's a 2021 book, Performing Power in Zimbabwe, Politics, Law, and the Courts since 2000. It's, it's, it's also about the state and its agents. Uh, you have Karakwaranan, of course, the struggle over state power in Zimbabwe. Again, you can see that the focus is on the state 
and uh, what we get from uh, uh, from Karikwaya Nan there is, is how the colonial re regime and later Zantief deployed what he calls the authoritarian rule of law to stifle and repress perceived political enemies. So while he, this existing literature focuses on the state, law, courts, and power, in, in, in my uh, installment, I wish to focus on Zimbabwe's private legal practice and the dynamics of practic practicing law in a crisis situation. And in doing so, I, okay, so I, I've shown you where I get in there. It's, uh, Say it's, 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 I'm, I'm adding to what George has written. He, he also has another article through the narrow door narratives of the first generation of African lawyers in Zimbabwe. So he's talking about the first generations after independence. Then I'm bringing in the crisis generation of lawyers in Zimbabwe after 2000 to, to, to the present. Just to complement what we have. What motivates me, I'm motivated <clears throat> being a former practitioner in court performance as a state council or public law prosecutor or law officer, whatever all those labels were piled on me during those days. Uh, I felt that I could use my experience there to try and understand the dynamics around private legal practices in, 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 in crisis within Zimbabwe. And I also am also motivated by the desire to complement this uh, emerging board of literature that I referred to on the law, state, power, and, 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 and I do that by focusing on a different set of court officers beyond those associated with the state. In terms of methodology, uh, this is going to be a qualitative start that, that is going to draw on interviews with practicing legal practitioners. I have interviewed quite a number so far, court officials, both the state and the bench, litigants, newspaper reports, officials from the Law Society of Zimbabwe. And the Law Society of Zimbabwe is an association formed in 1981, which is mandated with registering lawyers and regulating how lawyers and law firms operate in Zimbabwe. I hope to get a, a, some documents or to talk to some people there. I'm here to do so. Uh, I also intend to peruse records of the legal practitioners disciplinary tribunal to identify patterns, nature, and the course of trans transgressions over time. I will also consult, or I have also consulted some of the decided reported cases that are found on the website of the Zimbabwe Legal Information Institute. Uh, 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 the Law Society, this is in UK, the Law Society, this is in Square, and in other cases, which give me an insight into the kind of transgressions that lawyers are accused of during this crisis period. And I try to connect that with the crisis period. I also intend to, or oh, I've also I've consulted such statutes as the Legal Practitioners Act particularly section 23, which prescribes acts and omissions which constitute unprofessional, dishonorable, or unworth conduct on the part of a registered legal practitioner in the conduct of his or a practice. As such, or as a noted public or conveyancer, and the same act empowers the law society to prescribe through bylaws further acts which shall constitute such unprofessional dishonorable and worth conduct. And against that background, the Law Society resolved on the 2nd of December 2013 to add on the acts of misconduct, which found legal expression in Statutory Instrument 37 of 2018, which is titled the Legal Practitioner's Code of Conduct by Laws of 2018. So I've also looked at that, and I'm still in the process of synthesizing that information for the purpose of the paper that I referred to for the workshop. So in terms of the conceptual framework, I've said I am going to deploy 
Jerem Jones Kia Kia concept and, and extend it to what I can form practices in the in, 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 in the practice of the law. And uh, by this, I, by Mishikashika practices, I mean no respect for rules and in the system and not getting survival under difficult circumstances. Uh, so this concept of Kia Kia, as I said, was popularized by Jones in his article on ordinary people's often unorthodox survival strategies and tactics during Zimbabwe's hyperinflationary crisis. And in this study, I will extend it to legal practice under crisis in Zimbabwe. And I will specifically look at how the legal fraternity responded to the economic crisis. By putting Zimbabwe's legal practice on the spotlight, I hope to add to the growing academic interest in Zimbabwe's legal history, which I have referred to earlier. And what I've discovered is that due to the polarization of Zimbabwe's political legal space, uh, we often have literature that focuses more on the state and its agencies as proponents of lawfare, judicial capture, and corruption. Yet, with regards to corruption, it is tried that it takes two to tango. And it is against this background that I focus on private legal practice to illuminate the ways in which lawyers have responded to the crisis in Zimbabwe. I've already shown how I'm going to do that in terms of methodology. And uh, I've also shown how historically the legal profession is built on assumptions of honor or perceptions of honor. Uh, it has over the years been considered an honorable profession. While magistrates and judges are addressed as your worship, if you are addressing a magistrate as your worship, and the judge, my lord or my lord, the court has also been described as honorable. If it pleases this honorable court, uh, your worship to do this and so on. So it's, it's couched in a way that presented a picture of an honorable institution, which is manned by honorable officials, both in the private and public sector. However, uh, the situation seems to have significantly changed under Zimbabwe's crisis economy. Uh, characterized by Kia Kia and Mishikashika kind of business across the socioeconomic landscape. So one of the issues that came out of the interviews that I, that I had is the, what I call the rented chair and eat what you kill kind of legal practice. Uh, the rented chair is normally something that we normally hear of in hair saloons. Where, whereby a hairdresser just gets in there to rent a chair and operates in almost an in independent uh, practice. The same, the same kind of scenario is now in the legal profession, where you have a, a person who finishes his law degree at the university is supposed to get to a law firm as a professional assistant, who is going to is supposed to be under privilege. For, for a period of three years, if I'm not mistaken, maybe things, things have changed, I'll have to recheck. Uh, but because of the crisis situation that we have, it means that person is supposed to be paid by the principal, the, 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 the law firm. But what we now have is a situation whereby these uh, professional assistants go in and rent a chain. They go in there and, 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 and they are, instead of working under the supervision of a senior lawyer, they are just given space from which to operate and then they contribute uh, in terms of rentals, they contribute in terms of stationary in the front office, in the payment of this front office. So what that rent a chair and eat what you kill kind of, of, of legal practice is done is to undermine what is what we, the privilege procedure with implications for professional standards, according to the interviews that I've carried so far. And according to one of the cases that I read, which was dealt by the law, the 
in the, the tribunal, the disciplinary tribunal for lawyers, uh, where, whereby a principal or the principal, the, the principal, a lawyer in a firm was trying to, to escape liability by saying this person was a consultant, he was like under my supervision and so on. But still the court found him guilty for, 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 for that negligence. And, and so the renter a chair and eat what you kill kind of approach uh, has undermined the people in procedure. And this has had implications for professional standards in the, in the legal profession. Then related to that, I've, I've alluded to what I've called the opportunistic billing of clients and the smoke screen of prof professional tariffs. And, and as I said earlier, the hallmark of Mshikashika is that nothing is permanent or constant. They have bargains and sometimes the cost or price of goods and or services is arbitrary and a system and systematic or hazard. Under normal circumstances, lawyers are graded according to seniority and they are supposed to, to be paid uh, tariffs or to charge tariffs according to their seniority. But because of the difficulties that we have at the moment in the crisis ridden situation that we are in, from my interviews, it is imaged, it is imaged that even the most senior lawyer sometimes may end up opting for tariffs of the entry point lawyer. And, and, and there's no longer any system, it's a negotiation that is now taking place to say, uh, it's now opportunistic. It, it, you negotiate like you're buying uh, vegetables at the market or something like that. So it's also another thing that came out of my, my interviews uh, and, and which has a bearing on, 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 the, on the professional standards of a legal practitioner. Then the Law Society of Zimbabwe, which I've referred to as having been formed in 1981 and mandated with, with regulating uh, uh, legal practice in Zimbabwe. Yes, also it has also emerged from my interviews that it is now embroiled in corruption because it is the duty of the Law Society of Zimbabwe to inspect law firms to see that they're in compliance with expected standards, including making sure that they safeguard clients, trust funds, and so on. But from the interviews that I carried out, it looks like we are now in that situation of saying, oh, God, the God, because even the Law Society Inspectorate, the team that is responsible for, for, for the inspections and so on, is bribed. And, and, and silence, and in the process, it turns a blind eye to some of these problems that we see. And these problems end up emanating in, in, in the stories that you see in the, in the papers, where, for instance, here you, you have a list of 59 lawyers as delisted in one, in one report, and then another, another report we have the Law Society of Zimbabwe shut down 16 law firms whose principals failed to produce on demand money deposited by clients into their trust accounts or who took fees without doing any work or could not pay their bills and were even using borrowed chairs and so on. So the, the, the guys with the inspectorate team that is supposed to be doing the inspection is now embroiled in bribery and corruption activities and in a that the gut kind of situation. So this is also something that is made from my, my interviews. So <clears throat> uh, it has also come, uh, it has also emerged that the court attachment process, all lawyers who are going through training go via court, they, they go to, they are attached to the court at some point. But it has emerged that this attachment procedure, which is meant to, to fine tune the training of lawyers and so on, has actually been uh, manipulated into creating a network of criminal or into creating criminal or corruption networks where people, uh, where lawyers uh, acquaint themselves with the court system 
and individuals mining specific offices in the in the in the system, and then they manipulate those systems when they graduate and they come back for for practice. This is something that also came out. Then the section twenty three of the Legal Practitioners Act, which I referred to, which is, which prescribes conduct that is that is uh, deemed unprofessional, prohibits touting uh, for clients. Uh, but what has emerged from my observations as well as interviews is that we now have WhatsApp and so social media groups, and the police, police officers and other rel rel relevant stakeholders. We have lawyers in, in those WhatsApp and social media groups where they tout for, 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 for clients and then they even offer commission to police officers. So you have a situation whereby when a police officer arrests the an accused person, he assesses the means, is the first point of call to assess the means, and then he chooses which, which lawyer to call and he gets commission, he or she gets commission in return. So this 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 disguise, disguise the touting that is now taking place through the social media is also something that emerged on the question of how honorable is the the profession. So basically, I think that's that's part of what I, I have at the moment. Uh, maybe the major highlight of what I'm trying to do is a very, a, a wide circulating case, which was carried by most of the newspapers in Zimbabwe. And that case, involved a very prominent Harare lawyer who happens to be my friend, uh, who was arrested uh, for, uh, for dealing in gold together with the court, court, court official. Uh, in that case is one clear case which shows the, the network of criminality which emanates from the chambers of the legal practitioner via the office of the prosecutor until it gets to the chambers of the magistrate. In that case, a, a lawyer, a magistrate, a prosecutor, the accused person himself, and all police officers who were involved in the investigation of that case were all, were all arrested after they twisted the, the law to facilitate the release of 14 kilograms of gold at a police station, which was held in, in, in plum trees in exhibit. And this, 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 this case is, 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 is one case that uh, inspired me to, to look into these, these issues, to say most of the time when we are talking about corruption in the criminal justice system, we are referring to the state and its agencies, but we don't look at what the role of the lawyers is in that particular enterprise. So that's, that's one, and it's clearly, although the lawyers are the first link between an accused person and court officials, he, ordinarily they are, they are, they are, they are all in, cor in the corrupt, in the, uh, corruption enterprise within the criminal justice remains largely obscured. And, and for that reason, this, this intervention is, is meant to try and shed light on this kind of, of activities that take place in legal practice, in private legal practice. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Nube, for a very insight, inciting um, conversation and uh, an introduction to what I believe it's going to be a very exciting and robust uh, plenary session, uh, asking you various different questions. And uh, before we start that, uh, if I might abuse uh, my position as chair, uh, I'll just like to pose one quick question. Uh, I know a lot of us are also excited and looking and hoping that you would throw in one or two examples of uh, cases and anecdotal evidence uh, to support uh, your position uh, with, with regards to describing our justice system as a kia kia 
sort of system. Uh, but just out of uh, curiosity, um, to what extent would you con would you attribute the turbulent political atmosphere that existed within your period on time in shaping uh, what uh, people would come to describe as a uh, kia kia tactics that were being exercised and being employed by different lawyers at the judicial system, especially in light of perhaps those actions being done by these uh, noblemen uh, being different from what we would want in terms of if they are in support of a ruling party or an opposition party member and it's done against our favor. To what extent would such uh, those social tensions that exist uh, shape uh, the social idea towards uh, these uh, legal, the justice and legal system? Uh, and I'll take another question uh, from uh, Victor Guande. I see his hand is up. Uh, please feel free to raise your hand. Uh, or also, just jot down your question within the chat box if you have anything to say. Uh, Victor? Um, thank you, Brian. I hope you can all hear me. Yes, loud and clear, sir. All right, thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Swaneng, for an, in, uh, what promises to be a very interesting uh, paper. I really, really enjoy this kind of, 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 of stories. So my mine is maybe comment slash question, which is also related to the issues that Brian has just raised, is um, the heavy involvement of Zimbabwean lawyers in Zimbabwean political system. I would like to understand or to have your opinion on if the participation of practicing lawyers in everyday politics to what extent, if any, has it contributed to one, the degra degradation of the ethics in private practice, but also secondly, uh, the issue of prejudice and bias towards choosing cases, particularly those involving high political uh, uh, figures. How has that terrain uh, shaped out the change in ethics and the professional standards in the uh, uh, private practice of uh, by lawyers. Um, th thank you. Uh, thank you, Victor. And uh, Swaningi, before you respond to that, there's also a comment uh, by uh, Tawanda Chambwe within the chat box. It says, shocking revelations. Uh, and he expresses how it's unfortunate that we do not have uh, anyone from the sector as amongst our audience. Uh, Tawanda, we have a lot of interested and knowledgeable uh, noblemen amongst us, but uh, that's okay. And then he poses uh, two questions. He says, is there a way of getting this kind of research into the corridors of the law sector? And is there a way out? So uh, Swaning, if you would like to respond to these different uh, questions, while these other ones trickle in. Okay, sorry, I, I didn't get the last part of Tawanda's question. The last part says, is there a way out? Yes. That is the last part. Perhaps he can uh, always unmute himself and uh, ask it uh, and clarify what he's asking about. All right. No, I let me start uh, by responding to my brother, Dr. Gwande. Uh, actually, you have you have brought in another dimension that I did not look at. Uh, this the dimension of the involvement of Zimbabwean lawyers in, in, in Zimbabwean political systems and how that is uh, undermined ethics or, or, or professional standards. Uh, it's, it's, it's an area that I think fits well within this theme of kia kia kind of. of, of or legal practices. And it's something that I think I'm going to find a way of including in this paper. Uh, maybe it's something that, yeah, it's quite interesting to see how sometimes pol politics uh, overrides uh, professional standards. It's, it's very possible to have that, those kind of situations. 
And I think if if I dig deeper, I should be able to come up to, to come out with, with concrete examples of such situations. Uh, offhand, this I I I, I don't remember. I, I don't remember any particular case where I can say the politics here is is a, a playing a part in, in undermining professional standards. Uh, perhaps one other area that we may think of is how, how lawyers advancing a certain cause end up representing accused persons advancing a different cause and how they balance between their, <laughs> the, uh, their political uh, standing versus the, their professional standards. So I, 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 it's something that I really think fits very well in this kind of discussion. And thank you very much, Dr. Gwande. I am going to, to, to look at it and find a way of putting it in this paper. I think it fits in the broad discussion on, on whether this provision is still noble or, or whether we can say the, the illusion, the profession, the nobility of the nobleness of the profession has been diluted by political considerations sometimes, sometimes by economic considerations, which forces lawyers to sometimes go. I'm trying to imagine here a lawyer like Nyarat Gusai uh, representing uh, 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 employers against against workers. It, it would be something that is that would be very interesting to see if we can we have that kind of, of scenario and and try to understand the motivation around that. So I think it links again to the crisis that we have and how sometimes people end up compromised on on where exactly they stand because of because of other considerations. So I think it's, the same is linked to to to, Bri to to Brian's question on the turbulent political atmosphere and in how it shapes the the, the is criminal justice system and the place of the lawyer in, in that in the criminal justice system. Uh, I take them as very important comments. It's something that I'm going to 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 embrace in, in trying to widen the scope of what I I call kia kia legal practice in Zimbabwe. Then in terms of specific cases, we have them, I have them. I, I have quite a number of desi decided cases uh, which, are, which can easily be uh, accessed from different web, uh, websites on specific lawyers and, and specific conduct and their specific conduct. Uh, and how I have in mind here, I, I have one case, the, I can give one example here, it's the, the, the Law Society of Zimbabwe versus, versus Moses come, come there for it. It's a high court of, uh, uh, high court Harare 271 of 2021. Uh, in that case, uh, uh, it's clearly stated uh, the code, the misconduct of, of that come there for as a lawyer uh, did and, 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 and how the disciplinary tribunal reached its conclusion, which was to deregister, it was deregistered. And the facts of that case are there. If, if you just check using the citation that, that I gave. We also, I also have the Mchanti Bayer case, the respect case, uh, quite a number of cases. Where, where you see lawyers engaging in some uh, activities that are very dishonorable in terms of uh, their professional conduct. So yes, I, I have those and they are going to come out in the full paper, uh, but they are there for anybody who would want to see that. Then uh, Changwe, is there a way out? Yes, uh, this one is a difficult question. I don't, I don't know if, if there is a, a, I don't know if there is a way out, but 
these cases that I refer to that are taken to the legal practitioners tri tribunal and are decided in the various uh, uh, reports that we read about deregistered law, lawyers, closed law firms, there are quite a number of those, indicate that there is some action that the law society is taking. But at the same time, from the interviews that I carried out, it would appear that even the law society itself is not spared because the inspectorate, which is supposed to, to keep an eye on the operations of this legal practice, is also being accused of corrupt conduct or bri being bribed by specific law firms to turn a blind eye to some of the professional conduct that is taking place. So yes, it's uh, perhaps the way out is, I don't know from what I've said, whether you can say there's a way out or there's no way out, but that's the kind of snag that we have in the crisis situation that, that, that we have at the moment. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Swanini. Uh, there are two other questions that uh, have uh, come out uh, through the inbox. Uh, the person wants to remain anonymous. Uh, one of them uh, relates to saying, don't the formalities of the courtroom stand in the way of the justice system? Uh, this perhaps is also what you earlier on described the different, uh, perhaps what I want to call the nitty gritties. Don't they also interfere within uh, always following those, those, in fact, come on, the formalities, the courtroom formalities and uh, the conduct, don't those fall in the way of uh, actual uh, justice implementation? And then the other one says, uh, uh, by Mucha says, to what extent has the decay been shaped by the notorious state capture of the ju judicial system uh, in general in Zimbabwe? Uh, its link, is there a link at all? Uh, it seems to me that part of your story should also ex include uh, some of this uh, aspect. Uh, so it's a question uh, versus uh, also a comment and a remark. And then another question that comes in is, uh, what, in, what, in your own opinion, what is your case, uh, what is your take on lawyers defending uh, different social injustices uh, in the country? Uh, are they still noble when they go silent or are selective uh, in the cases that they take on? This also speaks perhaps to the part of uh, their presence and activity within different political circles. Is there, are there any other questions that Senon wants to pose? If there aren't any, uh, Spanini, you can perhaps go ahead and respond to these few comments and questions. All right, uh, thank you very much. So on formalities of the courtroom and the, how they stand in the face of justice, uh, I, I agree they do, although I, this is something that is really not, I don't think it's going to be covered in, the, in, in, in this particular paper. But uh, certainly formalities stand in the, in the face of justice. There are certain formalities that uh, make the courtroom uh, intimidating to accused persons, both accused persons and witnesses sometimes. Uh, I was there some, uh, in, uh, as I said before, I once practiced there. There are certain things that happen there, which I don't find justification, but which, which are just there to portray a certain aura of respectability and systematic way of doing things. But in the process, you end up, especially unrepresented accused persons, sometimes they, stand up, they end up not getting proper justice because they can't navigate their way through the formalities of the courtroom. So yes, I agree, including the dressing of the judges, that one that people have spoken about to say, why, why do they do we still need to have those white wigs for, for, for our judges and so on? So yes, the, the formalities to an extent are intimidating, cumbersome sometimes, and they stand in, in the face of substantive justice. And we end up having people who struggle to navigate the formalities in order to get justice. So I agree that these formalities are, 
like that. And then my take on, on lawyers who fight for social justice, but who then become silent or are selected in their cases. I think I, if I could, I think this one links up with, with, with Gwande and, and Brian's question to an extent. Is it up, not about lawyers taking sides? Not on the basis of, of professional standards, but they perhaps on the basis of their political allegiance or affiliation and, and pursuing, a, or maybe on the basis of where their bread is buttered. A, and at the end of the day, they, they, they are selective in, 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 the, in, in their approach. So I think this is something that if I'm to include it in this discussion or in this paper, I would love to look at it from the perspective of what Gwande is suggested to say, what does politics, what is the role of, of politics in, 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 in the undermining of, of legal, of professional standards in the legal fraternity. So I think it's something that we can expand on, on, on that particular point. Then on the notorious state capture, the notorious state capture of the judicial, uh, I didn't, I didn't really get the gist of the of, of the matter. But indeed, there are allegations of state capture. If you read the state capture, control, intimidation, and that kind of of, of stuff, I am a victim of that myself. I I. I had quite a, a fight with the then Attorney General's office, which is the prosecutor general's office these days, who were my bosses when I was in the prosecutor, when they were trying to give me instructions here and there, and I refused. Sometimes I end up in trouble here and there. And then the, the whole idea of using all punitive measures like transfers and, and so on to try and, and push people into compliance. I think the paper that Susan Bahuni writes on Ribe, good prosecutors, he clearly shows the kind of relationship that the state has with its agencies, like this, like the prosecution, which is supposed to which is supposed to be independent, and so on. So whether this is a bearing on on the corruption that is taking place in the in the legal fraternity. I'm yet to establish the link. Uh, but if we talk about the general the generation of the socioeconomic and political landscape since 2000, and, and perhaps that having a role in, in also, in, 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 in also uh, undermining professional standards in the legal fraternity. I think it's something, it's a connection that we can trace. But specifically the state capture, the judicial, the judicial, this, the capture of the judicial by the state and how it links with the corruption in private practice. I'm, I'm yet to, to find that connection. I, I take these corrupt activities, activities by lawyers as, as and orthodox measures by people who are trying to make ends meet in a very difficult situation. Uh, yes, the, the kukia kia kind of approach that I talked about. Even the, the billing that I talked about, the tariffs, where the rules are bent and so on in order to try and make sure that uh, the, they get some, something. If you stick by the, the rules and say, I'm a senior lawyer, my tariff is like this. You, when a person doesn't have that kind of money, you lose out on that. So you come down, you negotiate. Sometimes I know of lawyers being paid by goats and, and cows in small, smaller towns. And so it's, 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 it's not an uncommon thing. Yeah. yeah. So these are the kind of, 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 of practice that I am trying to cover in this discussion and eventually in the paper that is supposed to come out of this discussion. Thank you.
thank you very much, uh, Svaningi, for very interesting and uh, capt captivating uh, responses. Uh, before our time runs out, we'll take another question from Victor. Victor, I'm assuming that's a new hand, right? And uh, are there any other questions uh, before? Okay, so uh, Svaningi, before, when you answer and, and respond to Victor's comments, you may as well also feel free to give us a, a, just a simple roundup, a succinct uh, roundup on uh, what uh, the main thrust and the main argument of uh, your paper may be, and perhaps any other information that uh, you feel uh, is important uh, for this platform to leave uh, this uh, conversation having captured and known. Victor? Um, right. Thank you, Brian. Uh, yeah, I'd like to, to tap on your wisdom and experience uh, as running as a prosecutor. One thing that has become topical within the judicial system is particularly allegations of corruption, especially at the magistrates level. And more often, magistrates' uh, uh, decisions have always been overturned each time they've been appealed uh, at high court. And uh, sentiments have been that there is a serious kind of line of corruption linking the lawyers, the prosecution, and the magistrates. And, and, and in particular, the relationship between prosecutors and magistrates who apparently seem to share offices and may even have discussions of cases before going into court. I would like to understand what, what's your, the, I'm, I'm taping on your experience. What would you have a comment on these allegations about um, connivance between the three uh, parties, lawyers, prosecutors, and the magistrates? Thank you. Thank you very much, Victor. Uh, so, yes, from experience, it would look like uh, it's corruption is more prevalent in the lower courts as compared to, to, to the higher, higher courts. And the reason from my experience is that in most cases, if it's criminal cases, the first point of, of contact is, is, is the the lower court, the magistrate's court. So when you get to the high court, normally you don't even see the accused person, their relatives and so on, coming to, to the prosecution's offices and so on. It's the papers that are now moving. So, but at the magistrate's court, you, you have this kind of, of, of interface between the accused person, their relatives, lawyers, prosecutors, and magistrates. Yeah. So the, the case of the state versus, uh, uh, okay, uh, admired by, and, and I think nine others, uh, where, uh, where you have everyone who was involved in the, in, in the gold case that I did, uh, but everyone arrested from the regional magistrate who presided over the case, the prosecutor who prosecuted the case, the detectives who investigated the case, and the lawyer who, who, who defended the accused, and the accused person. So yes, there is that connivance, and it's, uh, it's prevalent. And what, part of one of the reasons perhaps is the over-familiarity, as you correctly say, of the prosecution and the magistrates. They are at the same offices, the same premises. When, when Gulan Devel was made the attorney general sometime there, he pushed, was pushing for a situation whereby the prosecution is removed from the courts. He was saying the prosecution is the first legal practice in the country. And he wanted to attract, he was saying he wanted to attract the best lawyers to, to the state councils in each court. And then he removed the prosecution from the court because he says by over familiarizing with magistrates, they have an unfair advantage as compared to lawyers who come from their chambers to the court. 
So yes, that observation, I'm sure when we came up with that, that, that decision, which unfortunately did not see the light of the day, he had made a certain observation about how that overfamiliarization, the kind of situation that it was creating. So indeed, it's a criminal enterprise and the case that I've just referred to is just one of the many cases where uh, I would say corruption begins in the corridors or in the chambers of legal practitioners because he is the first contact. It, now it even stretches to the police, like I've indicated to you, that police now have contacts contact details of specific lawyers to say, after arresting a person, they say they do the means assessment, assess how, 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 how endowed is this person, and then they choose the kind of lawyer that they would want, call him to say, well, then this person is looking for a lawyer, if that person is not represented or right. And then it begins there, from the investigating officer to the prosecutor, from the lawyer to the investigating officer, to the prosecutor, to the magistrate. And, and we already have a case that is, that is, that is well reported that I have referred to, where the magistrate, the prosecutor, the lawyer, the accused person were all arrested after they connived to release 14 kgs of, of gold, which was held as an exhibit. So indeed, that's the case. And uh, that's, it, it happens. Then coming to the main uh, thrust of my intervention, like I said from the very beginning, what I'm trying to do here is to, we know we have read a lot about the capture of the judiciary by the state, both in the media, both in, in, in academic circles, in the policy circles, we have read, we, know, we now know a lot about how the, the state has captured the, the judiciary and in the court process, the criminal justice delivery system. But the place of the lawyer in that conversation is, is not very much clear. And it is that place that I'm trying to uh, unpack in the discussion, in the paper that is going to ensue from this discussion. Uh, I'm trying to say, yes, the, the, the state and its agencies we have been kept the, the bench, the state prosecution and so on, may have been captured by political players and so on, or government and so on. But what is the place of the lawyer in the, in the corruption syndicate? This is what I'm trying to, to look at. So this is the, the major thrust of my work. I'm just trying to compliment the people who have written about court processes, law, state, the court process kept and so on, by also bringing in another court official because the lawyer, a lawyer is a court official uh, who is practicing independently. And, and so that's one. Then the second one, I'm trying to also expand on the literature on the crisis, the Zimbabwean crisis, by focusing on the legal, private legal practice. How, it, how, how the crisis manifests itself in private legal practice. And in, in this case, I'm looking at how the crisis has resulted in the, trying to make a connection between the crisis and the falling professional uh, standards in the, in, in the legal practice. So this is what I'm trying to do in that paper. That's the major focus of it. All right, uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Swaning. Uh, two, two or three other questions have uh, come in, but uh, I'll send those to you uh, privately uh, because uh, of our time, which has uh, unfortunately run out. Uh, but thank you very much to everyone who attended uh, this uh, JAR seminar series. We will hold our next seminar series uh, in a fortnight. Uh, I thank you all for the participation that you gave today. and. Uh, we pray and hope uh, this continued participation continues uh, to reveal itself in the other seminars. Uh, thank you very much, everyone, for your attendance. Uh, do stay well, do stay safe, and uh, we will be in touch with uh, more information regarding uh, the seminar series. Do take care of yourselves. Peace and love. Thank you. <laughs>